Is there an unseen realm behind the curtain of what we can see with our eyes? Is there a supernatural reality behind the one we know? I attempt to explain the unexplainable and get to know the unknown beyond the veil of this dimension from a Christian perspective. I'm Jerry, your host for Thai Girl for God Radio. Did dinosaurs coexist with mankind? Or did dinosaurs exist long before mankind was ever born? The issue of whether or not dinosaurs existed with mankind has been a hotly debated topic because young earth creationists state that there is archaeological and forensic evidence to support the scientific accuracy and timeline of the Bible which is that dinosaurs or dragons coexisted with mankind, and old earth evolutionists state that the evidence points to dinosaurs existing billions of years earlier. Our guests tonight are Paul Humber of CR Ministries and Bill Ludlow, and they discuss and debate whether or not dinosaurs coexisted with man. Now, Thai Girl for God Radio presents, under the Paratruth Radio Network, Did Did Dinosaurs dinosaurs Roam roam the the Earth earth with with a Man? man. With With Bill Bill Ludlow Ludlow and and Paul Humber. Hi, you're watching and or listening to the Thai Girl for God radio show, and I've got my special guests today. And their names are Bill Ludlow as well as Paul Humber. And a little bit about Bill. Bill, even though he's not a professional scientist, he is a member of the American Geological Society, Southwest Paleontological Society, and the National Center for Science Education. He's been involved with creation and evolution discussions and debates for 30 years. And as far as uh, Paul Humber, Paul has been teaching mathematics for 30 years and he's also been studying creation and evolution for as long. He is an author of a number of books, including Evolution Exposed, and served as editor for Reasons to Affirm a Young Earth, Booklet 1 and 2. Also, he is an editor for Reasons to Affirm a Global Flood. He is the director of CR Ministries and actively involved in a variety of ministries, including Christian Release Time in the city of Philadelphia, and also has been involved in the pro-life issue. Welcome, gentlemen, to this friendly evolution slash creation (laughs) debate, and we're going to focus it on just one topic in the wide array of creation and evolution topics, and that would be about dragons, dinosaurs, rather. Uh, So, Bill, would you like to begin? Sure. Thank you, Gerilyn. Thank you, Paul. I'd just like to speak briefly about the age of dinosaurs, uh, which we consider to be 245 million years ago to 66 million years ago. Um, And uh, one of the, probably the most significant event, of course, is the extinction event um, surrounding that, which uh, uh, lies at the KPG boundary, um, which is one of the most dated layers of of Earth um, probably in the world. Um, the KPG boundary is where we find an iridium layer. Um, the iridium is, is uh, residue left over from the asteroid that struck down in uh, Central America. Um, iridium is not a common element in concentrations like that, but it is common on, on asteroids, and that's how they've determined that. Um, the, uh, that date, like I said, that layer is one of the most dated layers on Earth. Um, there's a study here called Time Scales of Critical Events Around the Cretaceous Paleogene Boundary. Um, and it talks about uh, several different dating methods that they used on it. Um, I don't know if we can see this or not, but it shows a little chart here. Um, the KPG boundary is right here. And what they're actually dating is they're dating volcanic layers and coal that, that lay above and below that. Um, using several different dating methods, we're coming up with um, just on, above the, the KPG boundary in the iridium layer, we're coming up with 65.9 million years old. 
Um, and just below it, we're coming up with 66.003, 66.019. Um, again, several uh, different, um, several different uh, dating methods are in concordance on this. It's not just one method, um, not using just the same, the same thing. They use actually um, more popular dating methods now are, are argon, argon. We used to use potassium argon a lot, the KAR method. Um, argon, argon is an isochron dating method, which means it's not just a radiometric dating method. Uh, the isochron methods work by measuring a third stable isotope in addition to the pair that gauges the radiometric decay. Uh, having that third isotope allows us to measure how much argon was present initially. So we don't have, there's no guessing at a parent-daughter isotope, which I know a lot of creationists will bring up that issue with the, uh, the KAR dating. With the argon, argon, the AR, AR, it's just simply not an issue. Um, modern dating methods are, are, I believe, accurate. I mean, uh, again, this iridium layer where we see no dinosaur fossils above it. We don't see any dinosaur fossils originating in layers that originated or coming from layers that originated above this, this KPG boundary. Um, and it's one of the most dated layers on Earth. So um, we don't find them any younger than 66 million years old. So I guess that would be my opening statement is uh, we never find the fossils anywhere except below that layer, and it's a very well-dated um, layer, you know, using by several different methods. Okay, Paul, do you have anything to say about that? Yes. Uh, first of all, the you mentioned layers, and uh, there's the assumption there that these uh, layers were laid down over millions of years and so on and so forth. Uh, I have an extremely different perspective on the layering, and it's associated with a global flood. Um, you uh, refer to dating. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of Mary Schweitzer, and this relates to dinosaurs specifically. Have, have you heard of Mary Schweitzer? Oh, absolutely. Mary? I'm very yeah. familiar with that, yeah. And uh, I have corresponded with her personally, and uh, she has sent emails to me, and she said something along the line when she discovered soft, flexible dinosaur tissue. She said that not in her wildest dream would she have imagined that such would take place. Now, Bill, you, all, you held up a, uh, a table giving dates. I'm holding up here a table giving dates. It's in one of my booklets, and again, it's called Reasons to Affirm a Young Earth. That's what it looks like on the front cover. And uh, I asked Dr. Mary Schweitzer if she gets carbon from the dinosaur bones, and she said that she gets a lot of carbon, which, uh, and, and believe it or not, even though evolutionists would assume that there's no sense even carbon dating them, the, the carbon from dinosaur bones. Nevertheless, creation scientists have dated, and they come up with figure, figures, uh, chronological figures, that are much less than even one million years. So the issue of dating... It seems to me that the evolutionary perspective is very dependent on radiometric dating. But even there, there are problems because in the very same rock, you can measure the chronology, chronology associated with helium escape. And you get on the, from the same rock two extremely different ages. So... Uh, there's something wrong if in the same rock you have two clocks uh, giving radically different readings. And many dinosaur bones have been tested for uh, remaining carbon. Carbon-14 dating is good for 
maybe 200,000 years. But these readings give uh, readings for uh, carbon-14 that are much more recent, roughly 20,000 years as opposed to 200. There is residual carbon-14 in these dinosaur bones. So there's a huge question about the uh, radiometric dating. There's something wrong somewhere. And there are, of course, many other bits of evidence, but I think I've spoken enough, and I'll stop for now. Okay. All right. Well, a couple of things you said were in error, and it was just we need to actually explain what carbon-14 dating is and, and how it's used. Um, carbon-14 dating has – carbon-14 is, is changes um, into carbon-12, and they can measure the, the rate of the change there. Uh, it has a half-life of 5,730 years. Um, the maximum practical use for it in the age of dating anything is 55,000 years right now. Um, there's some using mass uh, spectrometry, you know, different things now. They can get up to, they say, 100,000 years. But it, it's generally accepted that it's accurate up to 55,000 years using standard uh, radiocarbon date type tests. Um, you can't date fossils with fossilized material, permineralized material with carbon-14 dating. It, what, you, what you date with carbon-14 dating are things that were once living. Um, and, and you can't date minerals with it. You can't date rocks with it. If a bone is permineralized, <coughs> a fossil, a dinosaur bone, let's say, you can't use it to date it. Um, it doesn't work. You're dating the permineralization. You're dating the, the, you're not dating the organic material. The organic material has been replaced in that case. So that's one, one of the main reasons we don't date uh, dinosaur bones is they're mineralized. Um, so, you know, we, we uh, um, and, and we already know based on the fact that they're found below the iridium layer, they're over 66 million years old. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure about what the, the helium was that you were talking about in there, but um, again, we, we just have several several different dating methods that are accurate on that. Um, Schweitzer, uh, I'm kind of glad you brought her up. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the most recent paper she published. Um, I believe it was the end of 2014, early 2015, where, um, well, I'll just quote what, what was written in here. Schweitzer has another uh, theory related to the chemical activity of iron found in blood. She identified a gothite-like nanoparticles in the fossil soft tissue, which she believes may have been derived from hemoglobin. Um, she goes on about how she thought about it. But uh, she says, basically, essentially the same process occurs when we use formaldehyde to fix tissues. You just cross-link everything so nothing gets, can get at it to degrade it. Um, Schweitzer has tested this idea. She's done tests in the lab now. Um, for about six years, using modern blood vessels in a hemoglobin solution, and uh, it, it's actually stabilized. I mean, it just takes weeks to stabilize. Um, they published this. Uh, this is a Berkeley lab report here from the ALS facility in Berkeley, um, and they used ostrich, closest thing you can really find pretty much now to a dinosaur. They used ostrich uh, blood and tissues there, and... Uh, using her hypothesis that iron would, would uh, preserve it. Again, it only took a state of weeks to get, you know, to, to being preserved. So the, the soft tissue issue uh, with Mary Schweitzer's dinosaur find in Montana and Hell Creek Formation is really a non-issue anymore. I mean, it's, it's been explained. Creationists don't like the explanation, but... Um, you know, it's been explained. Um, I know that creationists have sent some to be tested. Um, there's a one well-known case where they did get some uh, uh, fossils from museums that have been coated in shellac. Um, you know, different odds and end fossils. They send them off to be tested in a lab, and the lab comes back and says they're contaminated. They say, we don't care. We want results anyway, basically, and they... You know, they test them and send them the results. You're not going to get good results like that. I mean, there's a chain of uh, that needs to be followed, uh, you know, to prevent contamination. They have to be checked for contamination. If they are contaminated, they can't be used. Again, permineralization 
um, negates carbon-14 testing. You know, you're, you'd be testing bone then. Um, here's an example of Mark. Are you, are you familiar with Mark Armitage? Yes. Is that name ring a bell? Okay. Um, he sent a. You know, he he discovered a a, a horn uh, in the Hell Creek Formation in uh, Montana there, and um, sent it for carbon-14 testing. I've got a quote here. This was off of his Facebook page about a year and a half ago. He described it as, he says, I discovered soft tissues, stunning bone cells, which he, he I guess, found soft tissues in this too, in a triceratops horn, completely exposed to the harsh Montana conditions, comma, less than three feet from the surface, and riddled with fungus, plant roots, insects, rodents, we found all this DNA, he puts in parentheses, and countless microbes. I mean, he, he's picking up a bone, or fossil, I should say, that's found near the surface. It's got fungus, it's got plant roots, it's got whatever. They send something off to be carbon tested. How do we know that proper procedures were taken? I mean, any, any of those things would spike the carbon level in it. Um, and when we do find carbon levels in the dinosaur and bones, you know, again, it's, you know, 55,000 is generally the upper limit. Most of the time they're finding it over 20,000. They're finding 20,000, 29,000, 35,000. That can be due to contamination. Um, and it certainly, I, I guess you're trying to doubt, you know, the method because it certainly doesn't support a 6,000-year-old Earth. I mean, no matter how you look at it, I mean... It comes up dated 20,000 years, it, it's still not <laughs> bringing it close enough. I mean, you're still several times off from, from that being uh, uh, a 6,000-year-old Earth. Here's a piece of bone right here. Uh, this is a tri, um, triceratops rib from the Hell Creek Formation that I have. Um, if you can see it, I mean, this one is totally permineralized. Permineralized, I can't say that very well today. But... Uh, um, but replaced. I've got some other fossils that help. Again, completely permineralized. They're, um, you know, there's no. Some creationists act like they, they're finding these things almost with meat hanging off them. I mean, soft tissue, soft tissue. Um, she sliced these things thin, soaked them in acid for weeks to get them flexible, to get them to the point where she could look at them under a microscope. You know, uh, they didn't come out of the bone soft. So they're describing soft tissue, but it didn't come out soft. They're still inside a fossil that's permineralized. And uh, again, dating something like that with carbon-14, when you know you're going to get a bad result, is, uh, it doesn't mean anything. It just doesn't mean anything. Uh, the, uh, I debated uh, Dr. Brian Richmond uh, back in 2003, and we discussed, and this that debate was actually uh, videotaped, and he's an evolutionist, and he said the same thing you're saying. Everything is, uh, you know, turned to, there's no original material left at all. And I think you tried to intimate that Mary Schweitzer's uh, material that she found may be just mineral. But she is saying uh, over and over again that it is not just its original dinosaur protein, uh, collagen, uh, original, even, even the possibility of remnants of, of blood cells. And that is consistent with what, what Mark Armitage found in the Triceratops horn. Uh, flexible, sure, it's not. Uh, I, you've never heard me say they get bone with meat hanging off the flesh, although they have discovered, apparently, skins, uh, dinosaur skin, and I, we can talk about that if you want. But um, the uh, uh, what Brian Richmond said is that, you know, essentially there would be no carbon left. And it was that was two years before Mary Schweitzer came out with her discovery and her email to me personally that she gets a lot of carbon. Now, you want to characterize it perhaps as just uh, uh, contamination from roots and this kind of thing. No, these are scientists. They know how to uh, get to the, uh, the basic material 
uh, I think in the case of Mary Schweitzer, I think that the femur bone cracked. And they, it wasn't the intention, but she she went right to the internal regions, I believe, of the femur burn, bone. And uh, uh, Mark Armitage went to, the, I believe, to the inside of that uh, triceratop horn. So, and they both get uh, soft, flexible t- tissue, which just should not be. And again, repeating what Mary Schweitzer said, not in her wildest dreams. And she's an evolutionist. So it was very surprising to her. And uh, to uh, intimate that that these studies that have been made, where they do get measurable amounts of uh, uh, carbon-14 in various studies, and you referred to the fact that, uh, you know, the upper limit is 55, but almost all of them, in fact, I think all of the ones in this book I'll hold up the uh, picture of it again for anybody in the audience that wants to see it. All of them are much less even than 55,000 years, even 50,000. So, and that's just one of many uh, issues that can be brought to the fore. For example, uh, a dragon skull, uh, the the, uh, evolutionists are allowed in the uh, naming of this skull, uh, Draco, Draco, Draco is the Latin for it, word for dragon, and Draco is in it, and uh, and that's a it looks so much like the images that we have about uh, dragons. Uh, you you have the in Taprom, you you in Cambodia, you have an eight hundred year old sketch of a stegosaur type creature. And you could say, well, they imagined uh, uh, it from maybe some bones that they dug up. But there is huge evidence that man actually has had uh, contact with dragons. Uh, The Chinese uh, zodiac has 12 animals. Eleven of them are animals that we know, know about. The dog or the pig or whatever. But one of them is a dragon. It would it seems strange, but that would be in harmony with the uh, the eight hundred year old um, uh, stone etching of uh, an animal that looks very much like a stegosaur. Uh, and down in the Amazon, you've got uh, a, uh, p- a petroglyph of uh, of natives fighting against with spears or what, javelins or whatever. A creature that has the long sauropod type neck and so on and so forth. And we could go on and on, but I'll give you an opportunity to respond before just sort of talking the whole. Although, did I bring up a new topic? Or maybe I did. So I did bring up a couple of new. So you can sure. respond to that. Yeah, I'd love to. Actually, I'm glad you brought up the, uh, the temple. Um, uh, I believe this is the one you're talking about here. Yes. Okay. Um, let's just take a look at that, if we can. Uh, hopefully you guys can see that pretty well there. Okay. Yeah, this is the drawing right here. And this is what they're, they're saying looks like a stegosaur. Um, and, and mainly, I guess, because of these fin-type thing-looking things on, on its back. The plates, um, right. Right. Right below that's a, a rhino that would be native to that area. I want you to take a look at the shape of the head. Take a look at the legs, the tail. It it doesn't look anything at all like. But it doesn't have any plates. Right. Okay. We're going to get to the plates in just a second. But look at the outline of the actual animal there, without plates. Okay. Shape of the head, legs, tail. I mean, it's just a spitting image of a rhino. Look at the stegosaur there. I mean, a tiny head, much longer tail. Um, different shaped plates. I mean, it's it really, it, it's it's certainly not an accurate drawing of a stegosaur. If he tried well, to draw it may not be an accurate drawing. It certainly drawing, looks that... just like a, like a rhino. Um, those plates, in Minus matter of fact, plates. yeah, the plates, um, I had them here. Uh, I've got a, an image that actually shows um, plates on another drawing 
uh, other drawings made in the area. And um, yeah, I can't seem to find it right now. But there are some other drawings that were made in that area. Hopefully I'll find it here before we end. And uh, there's a face, and it has the same plates going right around it on the top. top has plates like that going around it on the bottom. Um, it, it seems to be a real stylized thing. Um, also, are you aware of the carving that's too directly below that on the temple? It's a lion yeah. standing up with a shield, a sword. I mean... Obviously, not something real, you know what I'm saying? Um, we, we see gargoyles all over ancient temples, buildings, whatever. Um, nobody thinks that they're real. I mean, why would we look at a, what to me looks like a rhino with a stylized background and, and uh, you know, think it's real? So, um, to me, it's, it's terrible evidence completely this terrible is the, evidence. the picture of that uh draco uh, skull yeah i don't know like if you dragon. can see the knobs and the and the and the spikes and so yeah, on, I'm familiar on with it. It too. Uh -huh. but there's tremendous evidence of literature of uh uh you know humans encountering uh dragon creatures and uh again the uh, zodiac the chinese zodiac has 11 uh, real animals, and uh, one disputable animal, the animal that you would say is mythological, because uh, because humans never met these creatures. But I believe that uh, humans have. In fact, uh, there are many animals that may yet be discovered. Evolutionists had the idea that the coelacanth fish uh, went out of existence uh, 65 million years ago, and yet they're catching them off the coast of Madagascar and other places. So sure. there are what you call living fossils. The Wallamy, Wallamy pine uh, tree uh, was thought to be extinct long ago, and lo and behold, there's a whole grove of them growing. These are called living fossils because we, we don't expect, uh, at least if you except conventional dating, you don't expect to see them. But then you see them. Uh, the bat that we saw out in our backyard flying around the other night, evening, uh, the earliest bats looked just exactly like bats. There's no change. And where did they come from? They, uh, did, did they come from a mouse? Is there any evidence of, uh, uh, of an in-between form between a mouse and a, and a, and a, and a, a bat? There is no intermediaries. There are, I don't know how many thousands of types of bats in the world. But, uh, and I wanted to talk about helium in deep granite. It challenges the conventional radiometric dating of rocks. Its leak rate from zircon crystals points to an Earth only thousands of years old, not billions. The nuclear decay products in the very same rock, therefore, must have devolved much more rapidly than conventionally assumed. Do uh, you want me to mention a few more things? or I don't know. I, I just don't see where it's relative. That's not a, a method we use to date the Earth. And yeah, it well, because, because there is a, so. there, respectfully, Bill, there is a huge bias probably on both sides uh you know one wants to hold to great antiquity for one thing how can you have evolution even happening unless you have theoretically all this so anything that gives uh old age uh is going to be attractive to an evolution that that needs it but if there is another legitimate method for uh a clock for gauging the date or dating of rock from the same thing, I mean, uh, it 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 shows that it the uh, things happen much more rapidly, and it's not the only chronometer. Um, another case uh, talking about the layers and that they were laid down over millions of years and so on, but you have trees that span multiple layers called polystrate uh, fossils, and they go through multiple layers. So those layers were laid down essentially 
or closely, almost simultaneously in connection with the global flood. We have enough water on Earth today, 70% of the surface is water, and in parts it goes down miles. If everything, if the Earth were smoothed out to be a sphere, there would be enough water that we have on Earth now to exceed a depth of one mile all around the entire globe. So uh, there is huge evidence of, uh, I mean, we talk about sedimentary rock. 70% of the rock is roughly uh, sedimentary, water deposited. And the layers came about not over millions of years, gradual, gradually building up. And these polystrate fossil trees that go vertically through multiple layers, maybe let's say seven, eight, nine, whatever, uh, a tree just doesn't survive a million years and continue its fossilization. It disappears. Uh, so there are huge uh, problems, and Mount St. Helens uh, gives us a wonderful laboratory of... Uh, uh, we witness the eruption and the aftermath of the uh, eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980 and it showed scientists that geological phenomena they thought took millions of years to form can form in mere weeks, days, or even hours. Okay. Um, as far as the helium goes, I, I'd like to respond to all three of those uh, because actually those are some really typical, um, not, not the helium one isn't so much, but the other two are very typical creationist arguments that, that are completely unfounded. Um, as far as the helium goes, you said the helium leaks or something? What was it? The leak rate out of zircon crystal. There, there's a way to uh, measure okay. it. I'm not a physicist, but Dr. Yeah. Russell Humphreys is. And that, he, that's a dating method I haven't really studied. I, all I can say is it's not a dated method that we use to date. Um, the age of the earth because uh, it because it gives young young dates and okay. it would it, be un, undesirable to well, do it. it wouldn't be accurate i mean if it's going to leak out or whatever it was no uh, no it would be it, it is accurate okay no no, no the you you could, the the helium leaks out of the zircon crystal and you can measure the leak rate and uh, there's too much helium left in the rock to and allow for millions and billions of years these results are reproducible. Yeah, yeah. They can in test fact, it over and over and over again, and get the same results. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, if you, uh, you and know, what is the date the Earth at? Russell uh, Russell Humphreys, who is a PhD in physics and has done a lot of work on this, uh, he's one of the contributors in this this book. We have a number of people that with PhDs or doctorates and so on. So um, if, if you'd like a copy, uh, you know. You know, uh, I went round and round with, this, with, uh, with Ian Juby on this same test, the same thing a couple months ago. I don't know if you watched his videos or not. Yeah, I, I, but, uh, I know Ian Juby. He's, but, he's uh, a super guy. I mean, he had one test is all he could provide. Had one test that had a, a, an age of around, I don't know, 6,000 or 8,000 years. That, that was a... a Basically, I believe it was considered an anomaly, but that was his one test. Um, so I don't believe it is reproducible. But, but um, anyway, I don't want to. I don't know if we're talking about the same thing. Was he yeah. talking about uh, the helium uh, from uh, a zircon? I, I, again, I'd have to go back. It's been a couple of months. I'd have to go back and look exactly too. Yeah, I, I know. On helium be, zircon, uh, but I'm not and sure. And I highly but, recommend his videos. I know there's a there's a more than one way to test zircons using helium methods so i know there's a, a difference there but um anyway let's talk about polystrate trees are you familiar with the joggins formation yes okay famous well i haven't seen it but i know that okay. ian juby sp has right. spent a lot of time there famous tree i mean that's the classic tree that they show no 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 there are many trees in france all over in, well, in Tennessee, it's not just a classic tree. But this is the classic one. That, I mean, I could flip to Answers in Genesis or CMI or any of these websites right now, and they'll have the tree from the Joggins Formation are, are gonna, is going to be up. Um, it's a classic example. Are you familiar with the geological explanation for that that was given in the 1850s? This is not from Joggins. It's from Tennessee. It's on the back 
of my okay. reasons to affirm a global flood booklet. Okay. And, uh, and it says here on the back, this polystrite fossil, uh, it's a giant reed, uh, was first photographed in 1975 by National Geographic. One of our contributors, however, supplied this photograph. It was buried vertically in the rock, cutting through about 10 feet of strata, and is located in Tennessee. Polystreet plants are common and reveal that the layers of sediments were deposited quickly, as in a flood, not spanning millions of years. Plants and trees rot long before millions of years. Okay. Well, you didn't mention which specific one in your first time through. I'm going to go with the one from the Joggins Formation, which is, a, again, a classic one that we see all the time. Um, that was explained in the 1850s. Um, that area is part of a fluvial floodplain. What that is is, is basically like a, the mouth of a river, and it was subjected to massive annual flooding. A, a tree would come down and could tumble, whatever, it hits the slower, you know, starts slowing down as the, the floodplain goes out. It gets tilted upright. It could have covered, been covered in years, easily. Um, no one claims that those layers took millions of years to form. And I bet if we went to the one in Tennessee, no one's claiming that people, that those layers took millions of years to form. Geologists know that some layers form rapidly. Okay. Do you agree they, that there are layers formed as a result of Mount St. Helens' ex eruption absolutely. in 1980? Okay. Absolutely. Do you know so what they're you made know of? that those layers were not laid down one layer upon a number of over a period not. of They were laid years. over quickly. Do you know what they're made of? Well, I'm not, I'm not a okay. geologist. Okay, they're made now. of unconsolidated pyroclastic flow, which is debris coming down the mountain, and volcanic ash. 100% volcanic in origin. Let's look at some of the 40 layers that we see, different layers of the Grand Canyon. That's the miners. There's the major layers. Are you comparing what we see in Mount St. Helens to what we see in the Grand Canyon? Is well, there, the is a, there, is there is a canyon. There is a canyon associated with Mount St. Yeah, the Tower River Canyon. It yes. The, the well, uh, when there's, there, you, you're familiar, if, if you've been in the Grand Canyon, with the... Uh, the the uh, the break between the uh, Cocono uh, layer and the Hermit layer. Are you familiar with that? Very familiar. Okay, and it's like uh, there's no. I've got a no piece of it right here. Bro <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, uh, but there's. Uh, there, it's it's a very smooth uh, 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 break between the two layers, and you one would expect, if there were millions of years between those two layers, for there to be all kinds of evidence of erosion, and the no amount of er erosion is extremely minimal. So uh, I believe that the Grand Canyon layers were associated with, with uh, the global flood. Uh, you know, and then you have layers of, of coal. You know, you'll see coal that is several feet thick, and then it stops, which would be suggestive of the uh, inundation of a flood on a global scale with the uh, moon, uh, tidal action coming and going. Uh, there would be a momentary either stop or recession with the low tide and then with the, with the moon continuing to orbit the earth, uh, a new surge of flood uh, sediment coming in and back and forth with tidal action. And that could, that could account for all kinds of layers. And that makes so much sense to me. But it doesn't make sense to say that this uh, 10 feet uh, of uh, layer was laid down uh, so many millions of years ago and then the layer on top of it uh, which in this case maybe it's an unconformity <clears throat> there's no in between layers there should be if evolution is correct but there is none and there, the contact line minimal erosion the strong impression that you get is that 
the layering in the Grand Canyon uh, was deposited over a period of months associated with uh, tidal action and the filling up, the bursting forth of subterranean waters and coming down in the form of rain and all kinds of volcanic activity and so on on a huge scale that we've never seen. But Mount St. Helens does give a little bit of a laboratory of what happened during the year of the of the global flood. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up. Mount St. Helens, actually, um, all the sediment we see there is volcanic in origin, 100% of it. Um, the little car river that was carved, um, it actually w followed the pre-existing canyon. That the canyon that was carved followed the pre-existing canyon for the most part. Um, there was a dam that broke, the water rushed down. People use that as evidence of, of uh, fast erosion when it was nothing but volcanic ash and what they call unconsolidated pyroclastic flow, which is loose volcanic material. Um, compare that to Grand Canyon, we have shale formed in continental shelves and deep water. We have limestone found and formed in, in shallower water. Um, we have Aeolian sandstone, which is formed in a dry desert. We have these layers alternate. Um, nothing at all like what we see in Mount St. Helens, nothing at all. I mean, night and day, one's 100% volcanic. Uh, the the canyon formed in a pre-existing canyon. It just basically pushed out the sediment, uh, and it was 100% volcanic. I'm, I'm glad you brought up Hermit Shell Coconino Sandstone. Well, I didn't know we were going to be talking about those, but um, I want to see if we could, can. Could I could I respond that? to that? Uh, sure. You know, comment. Let me just uh, get a picture of this before I put the light out. Can you see a line there? Can you see yeah. a line in in the middle of it? Okay. Yeah. Good. But that's. That, a, but you 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 agree that that's in not in situ, <laughs> so therefore it's automatically sort of. I'm not saying that you that you didn't get it from there. I have different pieces also. Right. I could hold up. Uh, you might be. I wish we could this. do photographs because I've got a great photograph. Here, uh, here is uh, you probably have some of the these uh, heron from oh, the I've green. Got a lot of green river fish. Yeah. 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 Uh, but that's uh, soft in the too, in the red wall limestone, Bill. Mm -hmm. of the Grand Canyon and, and continuing through it on that layer, you've got billions of nautiloid fossils. And they're and prevailing. Nautiloid they're all in the same position. And you're <laughs> even confirming it. You're yeah. even confirming it. I've they got, all seem to have the same... There's a lot of slabs answers. that are in others, but <laughs> that's... i got to stop you right there. I'm sorry. There's, a, there's not billions that... <laughs> no, there are billions, I believe. No, I'm not no, saying uh, all the billions are would be in the uh, Redwall limestone they found them in right a in the Grand Canyon. But that, that the, the Redwall limestone extends over a wide range, not just. So there could be huge. And the very, <laughs> you made my point when you showed all those nautiloids all together. They were jammed. So if you can hold, what were there? 15 or 20 and that I don't know. yeah but it's a common that one's out of Morocco uh, there's it's a common formation there okay. too um, we don't have billions of them in, in Arizona yeah, the Grand and we, don't, we, we don't have one creationist that supposed we had billions of them based on a, a very small sampling of what he saw in some caves there um, anyway and, and it's not evidence for anything other than uh, a school or a different you know animals could have died at once washed up in the same tide and been buried I mean we don't see them all going in the same direction all over the place. You see them well, going the ones that you held here, up. This, this yeah. Oh, yeah, they are. I mean, that's all right. I got it because it was funny. I bought it at the Tucson Gender and Mineral, Mineral Show because I see creationists use it all the time. I should have bought some of the ones where they were going every different direction because they have those for sale, too. <laughs> but, well, um, <laughs> yeah, well, it's anyway, too bad that uh, you didn't. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I did that one as a joke. Anyway, I showed you that piece um, there. That, that's That's... A conjunction between hermit shale and coconino sandstone. Um, you're probably not familiar with Arizona that well, that much. Um, we have what's called the Mogollon Rim, uh, north of Payson, Sedona area, going east. Um, the southern edge of the Mogollon Rim is the southern edge of the Colorado Pla Plateau, and where we find Grand Canyon. Um, in areas like that, 
we, we see transitions back and forth and back and forth. There's no knife-like transition between the hermit shell and the Coconino sandstone at all. Uh, what we see, and, and I've got a great photo of a road cut, so I said I wish I, I didn't print it out. I've got a, I didn't know we were talking about the Grand Canyon. But uh, I've got a great photo of a road cut with Coconino sandstone. Right below it, we've got hermit shale, red. Uh, it's, it's iron in the water is what turns it red. Hold on. We've got more Aeolian sandstone, and we've got, you know, more shale after that. It's obvious. Uh, there's a couple guys that have actually done a huge study on this, ancient landscapes of the Colorado Plateau, um, going back millions of years, showing what the Colorado Plateau looked like at different times. Here we are at 245 million years ago. Here's Arizona here. You know, we look at the different areas, the different inland seas that covered at times. Here we were almost all covered by inland sea 270 million years ago. Yeah. Um, this, and excuse me for using this uh, word, but, you know, when you, when you uh, look at the earliest kindergarten books on dinosaurs or whatever, often, the word used, the first word that it begins millions of years ago. It's a mantra. And I, I, I believe that people, uh, have just, I, I can remember show, someone showing me some fossils. When I was young, I was maybe eight up in Canada. And uh, he, he said that this is 300 million years old. Well, there was no date. He just said it. And, and saying something is so many millions of years old doesn't make it true. These fossils don't have anything on them that say, this is when I existed. It's an interpretation. And I'm saying that the interpretation that the, that the Grand Canyon was laid down over millions of years with n unconformities between layers where there are million year, millions of year gaps and so on with minimal erosion doesn't make any, anywhere near the sense of the global flood depositing sedimentary sediments all over the earth and in huge quantities and uh, the motion of the water at the time would have been affected by tidal high and low tides because that would have been going on uh, affecting the rise of the water and creating all kinds of uh, layering and so on. It makes huge sense. And it also makes sense uh, of the uh, ice age that followed the global flood. Now we're going to take a quick break for Jerry's Food for Thought. Now it's time for Jerry's Food for Thought. Here are some fun facts about dinosaurs. Rather than being carnivores, which are meat eaters, the largest dinosaurs such as the Brachiosaurus and Apatosaurus were actually herbivores, which are plant eaters. To help fight meat eaters such as the Allosaurus or Spinosaurus, many plant eaters or herbivores had natural weapons at their disposal. Examples of this include the spikes on the tail of the Stegosaurus and the three horns attached to the front of the Triceratops head shield. Pterodactyls are not dinosaurs. They were flying reptiles that lived during the age of dinosaurs, but by definition they do not fall into the same category. The same goes for water-based reptiles such as pleosaurs. Despite being long extinct, dinosaurs are frequently featured in the media. One of the more memorable examples of this is Michael Crichton's 1990 book that a lot of people know about, Jurassic Park. Adapted to movie form in 1993, the story, as you know, features cloned dinosaurs brought to life with the assistance of DNA found in mosquitoes trapped in amber. This was Jerry's Food for Thought. Okay, we're back from break, 
and I've got Paul Humber and Bill Ludlow, and they're discussing and debating whether or not dinosaurs coexisted with mankind. Let's not go farther. You're gish on me a little bit now here. We went into Grand Canyon. Let's stay with that for just a minute. Um, you mentioned the unconformities a couple times. Um, are, are you aware that there are periods of deposition and periods of erosion, okay? If um, part of the time an area is covered with water, we get deposition for sandstone, uh, limestone, types of sandstone, limestone and shale. If that area is exposed, then we have, compared to the areas where the deposition is, an unconformity. That's how we get unconformities like that. Um, as these things change, whatever. But you, and that's what we see around the Grand Canyon. That's what we see in the region around, throughout Arizona, is you, you have rock layers near Sedona that don't exist at the Grand Canyon. You have yeah. rock layers at the Grand Canyon, that, oh, don't interrupt me, please, that don't exist on the Mogollon Rim. Um, you mentioned the Coconino Sandstone, one of my favorites. I actually discovered 18 sets of pre-dinosaur reptile tracks last year in the Coconino Sandstone. Um, some of them right here are, are some of the best ones that they found. These were, I'm working with the uh, New Mexico Museum of Natural History, Spencer Lucas there, who's the director of paleontology, and we're doing excavation later this year, uh, and they're going to end up with his collection of the largest collection of Permian footprints that they have there in the world. Um, I'm intimately familiar with it. There, there's no way that you get tracks like this laid out in the middle of a worldwide flood. There's none. I mean, it's in the middle of the layers you believe are were laid down by a flood, right smack in the middle of them. Um, it's Eolian sandstone. It was formed in a desert environment. There isn't a single fossil. No plant fossils, no vertebrate fossils. Why? It was a desert. Those are not conditions conducive to forming fossils. There are tracks, there are burrows. I got great pictures of burrows too. Fossilized raindrops even. We got tracks, pictures of fossilized raindrops in here in the Coconino sandstone that, you know, it, it was a low-lying area. It gets muddy. We get raindrops that, that fossilize in there and uh, they get covered over. A, a dune is next to it. Wind blows the dune over, creates a natural layer. Millions of years later, it splits. There we are. I mean, that one was uncovered. We actually uncovered that layer to get to the raindrops. Uh, you can't explain fossilized raindrops and fossilized reptile tracks in the middle of layers that you think are, are laid down by a flood. Um, again, we have alternating layers. Shale, limestone, sandstone, limestone, shale, limestone, sandstone. I mean, it's all different environments. Some are deep water marine environments. Some are shallow water marine environments. Others are dry land environments. Um, it's just no possible way it could happen in a flood. Could you show me? Uh, and not one single layer. Say not one single layer of the same material found at uh, Mount St. Helens. Totally different composition. They, 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 you can't lay down limestone that fast. <laughs> it's, it's made of dead sea creatures, um, calcite, you know. I mean, it, it takes millions of years for that type of thing to form. Um, again, we've even mapped out, I, I showed you that book, we've mapped out, you know, what the continent looked like, what this region looked like. Uh, you got to look further than the Grand Canyon. You can't just stand in the Grand Canyon, look up and say, layers, wow, flood. I mean, it, it makes zero sense to any geologist, zero sense. Um, in the uh, slab of rock that you held up, mm -hmm. I don't remember seeing any uh, evidence of erosion. Could you show me the erosion? It looked like erosion? a pretty straight cut. Oh, it's a perfectly straight cut, yeah. Okay, so I mean, there's no you, erosion. In that particular layer, what you've got is you had shale, you had sandstone encroaching over the shale, and then you had shale come back. I mean, basically, the water level rose, the water level went down, and then eventually the water level, well, actually went down because we were near the transition and then and exposed uh, the desert again. Um, exactly what you would expect. You can't explain it by tidal. No, you cannot, because if you go and look at these layers, this is a little one, these layers can be 30 feet thick, or they can be an inch thick. Um, 
they represent different environments at different times. You don't get 30 feet out. But it's the same place. Side. It's the same location, right? Well, all throughout the whole area. The yeah, whole I realize that, that it, 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 it has a wide sure. spectrum. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, um, but but, but I mean, uh, you're... It's not at all like something you tidal action. How, how tidal action in the, the world is covered with water. Um, you know, <laughs> what is it just sloshing things around out there? No, I mean, no, I don't understand who, it. I mean, and, and uh, you know, it, you're talking about a world that's covered with water. You're going to use tidal action to explain something. I no. mean, uh, we have riverbeds in between layers, we have that. And we see that in the red wall limestone that area, um, where we actually have riverbeds that have been uh, eroded in between layers. There's tons of erosion in between layers. Like I said, there's layers that don't even exist in some parts because they were eroded away, and then they do over here. I mean, you look at the, the entire geology of the region, uh, you can't look at just the Grand Canyon. But in the Grand Canyon, there is uh, evidence of... Uh, of uh, stream bed erosion in between layers. You can't get a stream bed during a flood. I mean, Do you think the lamini of the Green River Formation uh, are annual, uh, annual uh, barbs? Bar I'm not sure. You know, I've read the books on it. Um, I have a real good collection of Green River fossils, actually. I have, I have yeah. a bunch of those, too. Um, you know, some people are sold that they are annual varves. Some people aren't. Um, let's say it's seasonal. Maybe it was four times a year. We're still talking, instead of 50 million years, what are we talking now? I mean, you know, 20 million years? I mean, well, it doesn't make that big of a difference. I mean, it doesn't, it's not proof for a young earth, that's for sure. So. Yeah, I remember uh, you mentioned that you're, you, you apparently profess to be an atheist. And Frank Zindler is sort of a friend of mine. I don't know. Do you know Frank Zindler? He yeah. was the editor of the American Atheist or something. Mm. And his, his reason, he believed that the varves of the Green River Formation were annual. But I don't know if you're familiar with um, uh, Paul Bockheim. No. Uh, he and uh, Department of Geolog Geological Sciences at Loma Linda. And he has spent a lot of time there uh, dealing with the VARVs. And this is what he wrote, and I can give you the title of this uh, article. It's uh, Lamini Counts Within a Synchronous Oil Shale Unit, a Challenge to the VARV Concept. And he writes, More voluminous sedimentation and more frequent sedimentation events nearer the lake margins than the center. The VARV model is not adequate to explain these differences because it would predict the same number of lamini lake-wide as well as consistent unit thicknesses and kerogen content. So there is a geologist who, in that article, uh, takes out the prop of Frank Zindler, again a friend of mine, that was one of his big, big things. In fact, I have an article that's available on the Can internet. Can I just say something before you go on? Because on that, I, I, it was my understanding that the the varves, the Green River Formation, are are caused by uh, like seasonal flooding, um, things that are uh, inlets would would bring in sediment um, a lot. I mean, is that your understanding of it too? Well, I, I think that it's perhaps a m much more frequent. I, I don't know if you're familiar. Because that would completely explain why we would have it around the edges. We would have more layers around the edges and fewer layers yeah. in the middle. And we're talking well, about an area which is very, was, some of those lakes were very deep. And, and the reason that the fossils are so well preserved is because of the anoxic conditions. Um, well, that's how, one of the reasons we know they were deep. Um, and uh, we had anoxic conditions there, which were... Uh, do not allow bacteria to grow and live. So the fish would die. They would lay down in the bottom and be slowly covered with sediment. It might take a month. It might take, depending on what, you know, the year was like, it might take a year or two for them to be covered, but they could be slowly covered because there was no bacteria. That's why we yeah. have those really good quality fossils out of the Green River. So, well, mm -hmm. Do you remember correcting me when I interrupted you at one point? Mm -hmm. 
uh, I, I think that maybe you have sort of interrupted me. Uh, I would like to uh, refer to Dr. John Baumgardner. Uh, there was an article about him in the U.S. News and World Report, and it said Dr. Baumgardner is, quote, the world's preeminent expert in the design of computer models for geophysical convection, the process by which the Earth creates volcanoes, earthquakes, and the movement of continental plates. He got his uh, master's in electrical engineering from Princeton, a Ph.D. in geophysics from UCLA. And I asked him if he had any insights about the Green River uh, Formation VARs. And he responded. And he said, I claim the geological record is literally screaming out global flood catastrophe. Varve-like laminae would then have to be produced by rapid sedimentation with rapid oscillations, wave-like conditions modulating the sedimentation process. A period of several seconds is sufficiently short to generate the number of laminae in the time available. One thing I can guarantee is that the evolutionary sedimentation rate of 10 microns per year will bury and fossilize not a single one of the billions or trillions of beautifully preserved fish to be found today in the Green River sediments. Now, that's an authority. Uh, mm -hmm. Even the U.S. News and World Report. And he uh, is saying that the varving that goes on there in harmony, in some measure, with Paul Bockheim's uh, previous quotation, uh, it cannot, uh, an atheist should not put his faith that these are vars that measure yearly sediments and so on, that therefore that proves that uh, the earth and so on and so forth must be millions and billions of years old. Uh, it's... I agree, it's, and I, that's why I definitely don't uh, hold to just a 100% uh, that we know that they're annual VARBs. Um, like I said, I've read all the material. It could be seasonal. I mean, it could be three or four times a year. It's not every time it rained. We know that. I mean, uh, it certainly wasn't a flood. I mean, a flood couldn't leave literally millions of seg segmented layers like that. We're talking tidal action, right? What would why, tidal why action do? Tidal action is wiping out things over here. It can't no, preserve no, millions it makes, of layers. Hold, hold on, me, hold on. You, you, you've interrupted me a couple times. Um, but, uh, yeah, certainly, um, certainly the Green River Formation. Are you familiar with John Whitmore? Yes. Young Earth creationist. Do you know what his opinion is on the virus? Uh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, he, is, he is post less. He is he says they're less he's convinced he's, they're post flood. So I got another young Earth creationist expert that just refuted your young Earth creationist. No, 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 no. no, no it, it, I don't, uh, he's I don't convinced know that, that they're post flood. He says there's I didn't no way say that they were that those, annual, that those varves could come in. Uh, Whitmore, Whitmore did. So the, the creationists can't even agree on it. Um, there's no consensus really on it uh, as far as in the scientific community. But what we have is 50 million years ago, we have tens of millions of years worth of very well-preserved fish, um, very specific conditions. Um, and uh, those specific conditions we don't see in the Grand Canyon. We don't see other places in the West like that. I you don't see, see how you can... You see it, billions of nautiloids. In, well, that's in nothing grand... like that's nothing like the preservation. Are you? I mean, you know what the preservation the, of the you held up in a, a really nice Green River fossil. I mean, you know what the preservation's like. Uh, you know, we have the bones, we have tissues in there. I mean, it actually is preserved soft tissue, if you want to call it that. I mean, in the yeah. Green River formation, fish. Um, which, which, which we don't see that. Other but places. isn't that supposed supposedly fifty million years old? Sure. Okay. So, uh, uh, Anoxic the, 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 the statement that all uh, organic material would be mineralized is, is to be challenged. Well, they it's are not. mineralized in the Green River Formation fish. There's no doubt about it. They're mineralized. Well, I thought you just said that they have, uh, you know, various aspects of the heron fish there that I showed up. And you said that they're probably soft uh, tissue there. 
And I agree it's, with you. It's permittalized soft tissue. It's not soft, soft tissue. It's not well, stretchy, not, soft. Yeah. No, but it, I mean, it, some of the original material is there. It's well, not. Well, the bones are original, but no, it's not original as far as no. They're permineralized. They're replaced. I, I they're think not. even the Green River fish to, ones are replaced. They're from, you're not going to find any. Nobody's found any uh, uh, preserved tissues in there, collagen, bone, and like that. You know, it's all permineralized. I mean, and uh, again, thousands of layers. So. Um, even if it was four a year for each season, you you can't you can't come up with anything different other than it still represents tens of millions of years. Yeah, well, I radically, I mean, I agree. We both look at the same uh, fossil. We both have heron from the Green River Formation. Uh, we we're, we admire it, but uh, your uh, view is that uh, they're fifty million years old. And I'm saying that they're much more recent within uh, uh, mere thousands of years, not millions or billions of years. There's no evidence for it. Oh, there's, um, there's huge evidence. <laughs> uh, you, you've, um, got, you, you've got... Uh, one thing I'd like to address is I, I did see on your website, um, I took a look at that a couple of weeks ago. We were first talking about doing the debate. Are you familiar with the hadrosaur? You, you have yeah. Hadros Fossil? Do you have that fossil handy? Or? Yeah, I don't have it handy. I wish uh -huh. I did. It's somewhere in the house. But uh, now What's the story behind that fossil? Well, it's, it, uh, it was given to me by someone, uh, and I forget the exact location, maybe somewhere in Colorado or something, or Montana. But uh, you can feel the weight of it. It doesn't have the normal weight. It is much lighter, and it's quite fragile. And, uh, you know, you could easily move your thumb along it and, and damage it significantly. So uh, it was uh, that, that hadrosaur. I've got 300, 310 million year old uh, fossils here that you could follow up with powder. I mean, you could bust them right apart. Yeah. The, yeah and, but, the, but they're still permanent. I mean, they're, they're, they're really you know, not that old. It's the type of sediment that they're in and, and, uh, the type of minerals that replaced them, but it, it doesn't mean that they're not old. But didn't you say that, uh, don't you claim that that is um, not permineralized? You said you have unfossilized. You called it the porous side of an unfossilized hadrosaur bone vertebra. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, as I mentioned, uh, Paul Kwepp, who's in Texas, he's the one that sent them to me, and he's the one mm -hmm. that made that statement. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if I have here some samples uh, he said on this uh, torched dino bone ashed and then this is uh, oh that's the same one uh, and this one says unfossilized dinosaur bone in this one and why, who is he uh, Paul Coop, I'm not. I, I guess. I guess this is an, un, an unfossilized. I don't. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, but I don't, yeah, I don't know of any unfossilized dinosaur bones. It's 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 uh, porous. Uh, but I don't know if I. You know, uh, he sent this to me. I don't consider myself. I wasn't there at the time, but. Uh, now, here's a piece of mammoth bone that's only about 10,000 years old, and it's already pretty much permineralized. It just depends on where they, where they are. So um, you can see the porous there. Right? <laughs> well, I, but, have, uh, I have some dinosaurs. You know, it just depends on where they are. But anyway, um, I was just curious because I saw uh, an article in CMI um, about unfossilized hadrosaur bones from Alaska, and I wondered if that was the same... Uh, the same thing that you were... No, I don't think this was from Alaska, but I, I could be wrong. Uh, it, it was sent, and, you know, I could have studied that particular issue, but as you know, there are a, a wealth of material out there, and it's sure. hard to uh, pull it together. Well, it was funny, because I traced the one from CMI back to the source, and uh, the source actually never said what Dave's saying he said, and he actually had prevented a retraction because so many people had contacted him about it. Um, but uh, the hadrosaur bones that they found in Alaska definitely were permineralized, and and uh, he even listed the, the minerals that were found in them. So, um, but I don't think you got a permineralized bone there, and I think you should uh, 
before you make any claims, you know, on a website saying that you got unfossilized bones, you should have them checked out by a paleontologist or geologist. I mean, somebody. Well, familiar. no, I'm not saying that there's no, that there's that there's nothing, but they're not completely, uh, you know. And you know, I'm I'm willing. I could, I guess, show. I guess you did show the picture of that. Uh, let me let me get what I what actually was said, so that we okay, can right, act, yeah. we can actually. This is what was written. Uh, porous side of an unfossilized hadrosaur duckbill vertebra. The dinosaur bone in the image neither turned to stone nor dust. Much is still unfossilized. Notice it doesn't say that there, there's nothing that's been fossilized, but much. Uh, bones do not have to be turned into stone to be fossils, and usually most of the original bone is still present in a dinosaur fossil, and that's in some measure what Mary Schweitzer, she, she actually got soft, flexible dinosaur tissue. Uh, and when they, she removed the mineral away from it, it, it had flexibility and so on. So that's what I have in mind, and, it, and this is a picture well, of the... Uh, well, well, my copy says, this was off your website, the porous side, uh, it is neither turned to stone nor dust, it says, much is still unfossilized. Then it says, in quotes, unmineralized. Um, much. That doesn't mean it's The tough. bone itself is rather fragile. Well, again, I don't even know if anything is unmineralized. I mean, I don't know why you would make a claim like this. I mean, I don't think we have any kind of uh, um, any uh, evidence that, that what he's got is unfossilized. I mean, I don't know why he would make a claim based on a, a note that somebody would sell them. I mean, you're putting this out in no. public. And, you Are you know, saying that the flaw, soft, flexible tissue that Mary... No, I'm talking about your hadrosaur bone. I'm talking about is your Is fossilized? No, I'm saying it's preserved. Well, it's um, preserved. I'm saying and the I, bone around is fossilized. Yeah, but, well... But, okay, and, and what I was talking about was your hadrosaur bone. I, I mean, I, we don't have any evidence that it's not fossilized, and... You're, you're advertising that it's unfossilized. Well, okay. Uh, it, it, it's, it's very possible that it's a, a poor word that was used. I, I don't know. What I meant is that, uh, I, and I maybe was using the term that okay. Paul Kwepp uh, used, uh, but what I meant is uh, it, did not, it didn't seem to be material, uh, mineral. It had the appearance of being actually part of the original porous structure of the, of the hadrosaur. Now, I'm not an expert in that area, and I don't claim, and uh, but, and I wish I had it handy. I I did look for it, but I, I it's in uh, the file somewhere. Is it true okay. that between the Kokono and Hermit contact, uh, that there's supposedly millions of years took place between those two layers? Uh, I don't know. Maybe in some places, um, maybe not in others. Again, I'd have to look at the no, but actual. But but the there's a, there is there is an age associated with the Kokono uh, layer and an age associated with the Hermit layer, right? Right. And uh, and according to uniformitarian theory, millions of years took place between those two layers. But physical evidence supporting such an extended duration seems minuscule. And then the Tapit's sandstone rests on Vishnu schist. And, and that may be there's a gap of a billion years according to conventional chronology. And my view, and the view of many uh, people, uh, is that the Grand Canyon came about as a result of the year-long global flood and the deposition of sediments, including uh, nautil nautiloid fossils and uh, many other kinds of indications. And it was not something that was laid down over millions or millions of years, but something that happened within a year. Okay, well, my rebuttal would be um, the evidence shows that we have uh, 
dozens of different environments, not only in the Grand Canyon, but throughout the region. Um, we may have, unconf you know, and, and those different environments create, again, shale, limestone, sandstone, um, different different types of rock. Um, How can you get millions of years the, between the Kokono and the Hermit contact? It, between the Kokono, between the Coconino sandstone and the Hermit shale, we might have unconformities. Like I said, in some places, we may not in others. You, you have to look at the whole region. There's been entire... Yeah, but millions of years. Devoted, devoted, sure, why not? I mean, if an area is exposed, um, it's eroding. If, if right next to it, it's, it's inland sea, it's sediment is forming. But that, right next that's to it is an area that's eroding. I mean, that eroding area is going to become an unconformity when the next layer covers. You're gonna, when, you, that's how you get unconformities, erosion in between layers. It, yeah, it's, but, it totally goes against a worldwide flood. You can't have erosion. the rock that you held up layers. is right in harmony with the global flood, and there's no erosion. No, it isn't. It, it shows... Where's the <laughs> what erosion? Do you mean there's no erosion. It's a piece of rock. What do you mean? Where's the erosion? The it's, a, it's a section. What did you say that that was the contact it, point? It, between it is the the erosion. Oh. It's 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 two different environments. Why would there be erosion between? There because be it's erosion. separated there, by it's two different of years. environments. You have the two the no, two it layers are separated. It didn't it didn't just get dry and then millions of years went by and then no it went from. It went from, like, say, like to say, a beach to a shallow ocean, a beach to a shallow ocean. That's what we see. There's no millions of years in between anything. No one claims there is. Uh, again, you, know, you look at the area here, and where you have exposed areas, you have erosion. Where you have, um, or you could have deposition in the case of the Coconino Sandstone, because the sand is coming from other places. But, but you're going to have erosion in the higher areas. You're going to have lower areas here where you're going to have deposition. That's why we see unconformities in places and not in others. Um, you know, you, you have to look at the entire region. You can't just look at the Grand Canyon, look at a wall and say, oh, that one looks straight. That one's it, it's not like that over here. It's not like that over here. I mean, it, it's, it's all different environments. Um, again, I just want to make the point that uh, we've never found human fossils with dinosaur fossils. Never. I mean... It hasn't happened. You'd find you think we find one if all the humans died, and you, you're one of the people that believe you're not a Ken Ham who believes the dinosaurs were on the ark, right? You think they all um, went extinct during the flood? I am a Ken Ham. You think that they were on the ark? Yeah. I thought you. Uh, did, I thought you. Uh, you said they went extinct. I, I read that. Well, else. I think I think that uh, it's very possible that they're. Uh, dinosaurs. I don't know extinct. where they went. I mean, but you know, I don't know <laughs> but but anyway. Yeah, but the, um, but the they, Noah's flood, the global flood is goes back for four, forty five hundred years ago. So it's <clears throat> there's plenty of time between that uh, time and uh, for there to be uh, go, uh, the the dragons that were encountered by humans that we read about in literature were killed off eventually, and uh, you know there may be no living dinosaur today, but I brought up about the <clears throat> coelacanth fish and other living fossils, and it may be I, that, that we will, uh, in the, some recess of uh, the Congo, for example, there may you know, we're, be... We're, we're gisglopping everywhere. You, if we're down the last couple of minutes, you've had the last four. I mean, come on. You know, I started talking and you went off again, so give me, give me the last couple of minutes here. Uh, you mentioned the coelacanth. I have a little pet coelacanth, by the way, so... <laughs> but uh, uh, again, very familiar with the coelacanth. Um, read several books on it. Um, I've, have you have you read the genome study on it? Uh, are you aware that there are eighty species of extinct coelacanths? Eighty species, and that that none of the two that are survived today are the same as the ones we see in the fossil record. The most recent ones in the fossil record, sixty-five million years ago, seventy million years ago. Uh, they're different. They're different fish. Um, they're they're different in size. They're different in skeletal structure. The the ones today have ossified swim bladders, which is an adaptation for for uh, greater depths. And they're not the same. Uh, they've completed the genome now, and it shows slow and gradual evolution, which would what would we would expect for isolated populations that are are very specialized. They live at over 500 foot depths. The reason we don't find fossils is because since the last 65 million years, they've been living at 
over 500 feet down. The deep water species survived. The shallow water ones didn't. Uh, we don't go digging for fossils on the bottom of the ocean right now. I mean, you know, it's, uh, we, we wouldn't expect to see the fossils in, in the difference in that time. Um, but once again, we've got uh, the um, never, never have found a human fossil with a dinosaur fossil. Not once. Every, every scientific dating method puts the age of the dinosaurs before man appeared. Man appeared, modern man, approximately 200,000 years ago. Dinosaurs went extinct 66 million years ago. We don't ever see it cross. Never. Um, the footprints, the, the, the drawings, it's all dubious. Um, none of it's good evidence. It, it's, it's just assumptions. Um, based on what somebody wants to see. Uh, no good evidence there at all. Um, Paluxy turned out to be the creationist Piltdown man. I mean, the, the Paluxy tracks down there, I mean, they were, uh, um, some of them, again, known fakes, part of them. Uh, ranchers down there admitted to making some of them. Uh, nobody knows anymore what might have been real and what isn't. Um, same with your Ica stones and your Acumbera figures uh, coming out of Central America and stuff. Known hoaxes, known fakes. Um, we've got nothing here. You, you brought nothing forward so far that even suggests to no. me that dinosaurs live with man. Uh, forgetting all about, we, we got way off into the age of the earth thing and the Grand Canyon, but uh, uh, sticking with the, grand, the, the dinosaurs to man thing, you, prevent, you presented no evidence at all. In other words, you're saying that the uh, Delk print is a fraud. I'm glad you acknowledged that Piltdown was a, a, a fraud. Uh, well, that was science, promoted yes. by evolutionists. Yep. Uh, I don't agree that the Delk pr pr print is a fraud. And there are many studies, compression studies, and, so, and you mentioned that you know uh, Ian Juby. But, uh, and then there are also, uh, uh, there's a picture that I have on the back uh, of this booklet. I don't know if you can see it. A uh, human, a mm -hmm. uh, human, you, uh, human, a human, a footprint that was intentionally damaged by, I believe, uh, evolutionists to uh, refuse it. It's on the back of the book. The person uh, who reports this not only said that he's willing to take a lie detector test; he took it and passed. And I know the person that presumably uh, claims that, or th there's evidence, I know the person that supposedly, I could mention his name, I could, I could we've corresponded a lot, and uh, I've asked him, I think, if he would be willing to take a lie detector test. And uh, as far as I know, he has never taken a lie detector test. So, to, so where's the to, evidence? To say... <laughs> right there, there. That that's right there. That was I'm destroyed. Not sure you that said you know about it. No, you said there's no evidence. So all I uh, need to do is to produce one bit of evidence, and there it is, right there. Human uh, footprint in Cretaceous rock. And I've got it. I've got a, the uh, former curator of anthropology saying it's a fake. So uh, zero evidence that uh, man has ever been in contact with dinosaurs. He chose a footprint. There's no dinosaur in that picture. There's no dinosaur bone in that picture. If he's going to dispute the dating methods, then he can't even say that they were the same time. He's got no evidence. Um, all the evidence that I have brought forth shows that man uh, did not live at the same time as dinosaurs. Um, I don't know why we really have to prove they didn't, since there's no evidence they did. Like I said, there's nothing that's correlated the two. Um, at all. And uh, as far as the age of the Earth, there isn't a single scientific dating method that puts the age of the Earth at 6,000 years. Uh, uh, anybody that would like to contact me uh, for these two booklets to give over 100 reasons to affirm a young Earth are welcome to do so. And uh, I would like to say uh, that in the book of Job, uh, now, Bill didn't want to talk about the uh, Bible, but this is the last 30 seconds. Uh, Job, the Lord himself, talked to Job about the behemoth, which is 
a dinosaur-like creature with tubes of uh, bones, tubes like uh, bone, uh, tombs like br bronze and uh, cedar of Lebanon and so on. You can read about it uh, in the Bible. I think it's Job chapter 40. And right, thank, thank you, you, Paul. Thank you, Gerilyn. Yep. yep. Take care. Thank you so much for listening and or watching the Tight Girl for God radio show underneath the Paratruth Radio Network. I hope that you found the discussion interesting and informative. The next time I will be on air is Wednesday, June 29th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time with my guest Daniel Duval of Bride Ministries. We will talk about spiritual warfare in the astral and dreamscape plane and other fascinating topics. It's a show you don't want to miss. God bless, and good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are at in the world. Bye.